Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Digital Supply Chain Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and with me on the show today, I have my special guest, Steve. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Tom. Glad to be here. I am Stephen Dana. I'm a partner at Drake Star Partners, and we are a technology-focused investment bank. In over 300 or so episodes of this podcast, Steve, I've never had a technology-focused investment bank on the podcast before. What's that got to do with supply chain number one? And what is it an investment bank does, a technology-focused investment bank does? So two questions. What, what do you guys do and what's that got to do with supply chain? We help companies raise money and we help when they're going to get sold or seeking an exit. And sometimes something in between quite often actually. And then uh, supply chain, as you know very well, is being disrupted by technology. And there's that means there's tons of change and tons of disruption and tons of new companies forming and growing. And I'm part of that ecosystem, helping those companies raise money and, and exit. Okay. And you specialize in supply chain or does your company specialized in supply chain or, you know, where, where does supply chain fit into the whole, the whole picture? I focus on supply chain automation. That's kind of a broad term. Sort of what does that really mean? To me, it's the technology, particularly for me, it's emerging and advanced technology that is in the warehouse and in the factory, primarily around robotics and sensing software some advanced services. And my firm, Drake Star, we're, uh, our technology focus covers a variety of areas, and I lead that focus around the industrial technology supply chain area. Okay, cool. And you recently came out with your supply chain automation report. Can you talk to me a little bit about what kind of findings you came out with that, that report? Yes, it's an interesting time in the financial markets. And, <laughs> you know, least. I've been, <laughs> definitely, I've been part of, as an advisor for, I guess, the better part of 20 years now. And so I've seen a few of these cycles, each being unique, but there's some, you know, solid, some lessons to be learned across them. In this current one, and from, you can see in our, in our report, deal volumes. So companies, you know, the number of companies raising money let's say, mm -hmm. or selling broadly around technology have decreased sharply since call it summer of 2000, you know, 22. But if you peel back the onion a bit there around this area that I cover supply chain automation, deal volumes were actually slightly up from what was record levels already going into the beginning of 2022 and then in 2021, the dollar value of those deals has come down a bit. And that mostly is from a reduction in the very large deals. But we are talking about, you know, smaller growth type companies, which is, you know, growth and mid cap companies, what, what we focus on, not so much companies going public or those sorts of things. In that area, there's been a lot of energy continuing and a lot of deals. So that was one large takeaway. And some of my clients are realizing when they just read sort of the headlines, it's not as obvious. Okay. So there's more happening in supply chain than in a lot of other sectors. Yes, exactly. It's in say FinTech and, and other areas, there's been a dramatic reduction, even in those sort of smaller mid cap deals that don't rely as much on debt or so the public markets, but even in that area, you know, other technology sectors, there's been a, a large decline, but in supply chain automation, it's still going strong. Why? There are, well, first of all, there, there are a couple macro factors. So one, there aren't enough people to do the work that needs to be done in a factory in a warehouse. Okay. And the companies that I'm working with often are helping, not replacing people by any means. They were, Mostly they're keeping people in the loop, but helping those people do so much more and helping, you know, customers 
satisfy demand without having those people. Um, so that's helpful. But also, there's been a movement towards you know, reshoring um, you know, factories and production processes back to to the U.S. I, I, we tend to have a kind of a global view, but just thinking from the U.S. perspective, that's another thing affecting things. And also, the tech is just getting better, right? Um, mm. What to be sort of science project stuff or you know pilot we call it pilot purgatory it's now you know production scale things that are occurring okay fascinating you were at promat this year the, the big conference in chicago i think it is what were the takeaways you got from that there were a couple of themes that jumped out from from promat and around technology, and I think are worth noting. And I think, you know, quite different from the last time I was there, which, which was, you know, admittedly a couple years ago. The first being electrification. So the industrial, a lot of the industrial world is turning to, is electrifying. And that obviously there are more sort of battery storage, electric storage, sense of charging systems and that sort of thing than I would have expected. The robotics companies, which you know used to have sort of smaller booths and weren't as core to the show, are now massive booths all in the center with huge lines and a lot of energy around that and becoming very large companies. And I think those were actually the two, you know, main technology themes that I that I noticed. And when you say electrification, is it like electrification for electric vehicles or is it like electric arc furnaces for for smelting iron ore or <laughs> where where are we there or, or somewhere in between or all of the above or what kind of electrification so electrification of the charging infrastructure and of OEM vehicles would be the simple way to put it and then the digitization of those vehicles and allowing them to be intelligent and nowhere everyone is and the safety elements of it. So I guess would be broad, a, a more, I guess a better way to say it is the digitization of, of the vehicles within the supply chain and then all the data and intelligence that's around that. And the other one is robotics. So there's a huge uptick in interest around robotics, at least at Promat. And are, is that reflected in, in deals you're seeing as well? Yeah. I mean, we, we recently, uh, we, it's my plug, but we recently raised money for a company that's that's in the robotic space that does sort of welding automation, which is in that factory side of what I what I focus on. But also on the supply chain side, there's been you know an increase in very large deals around robotics. So we have a company like Locus Robotics or Auto Store that are now you know becoming quite massive. Okay. What are some emerging technologies or trends that you think will have an impact on the future of supply chain automation? I think the machine machine learning algorithms integrating with autonomy is something that's been happening, but it really feels like we're on the precipice of something even greater. And it, it's been certainly been in the news lately around, you know, ChatGPT and you know, language models and it's not clear. I haven't seen that world merge yet with the autonomous companies in supply chain automation, but it's really interesting to imagine how that could start happening. But on the more you know practical day-to-day -day basis, it's just everything's being digitized and there's the, the different equipment and even people, right, are becoming part of larger sort of data platforms that are being optimized in a way as maybe several years back, it was a bunch of point solutions, nothing was really integrated. And now you're getting credible, you know, real solutions that are looking at this digitized warehouse more as a whole, holistically. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned chat GPT there. And I, I think it's fascinating. It has been revolutionary, obviously, I mean, fastest app to was it 100 million users ever. Combining that with robotics, if you could have a kind of a humanoid robot or a robot with a kind of a human face interface that can then speak back to you because we've got text to audio is no problem. 
Now we've got these large language models as well. So suddenly you could have these helper robots that you can interact with. You can speak to them potentially. I mean, this is, hasn't arrived yet, but, you know, this is where I see the two of them coming together. You know, you get your robot and you get your large language model with a, with a, a UI mix the two of those together and suddenly you're speaking in natural language to a robot and it's replying to you in the way that chat gpt replies to you in text today the robot replies to you in the same way and understands and carries out the tasks that you ask it to do i mean that's got to be the next big thing right an automation if it is <laughs> it would be really interesting to see which companies you know which players so how does that disrupt the existing ecosystem of those companies that are you know making a lot of money selling technology into warehouses and, and, and factories of course more broadly than that because i think those are very different kind of company that are than the ones that are doing that today and i can't sit here and pretend to know how all that's going to play out but i i love just it just you know gets me out of bed in the morning um being part of all this technology disruption, which is, seems to be changing at an even faster pace every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know guys like you are, are you know, keeping up with all of this and that <laughs> it becomes harder and harder every day, I'll tell you, but it's super interesting. Sure. Are there, are there any industries in particular that are adopting these kind of automation technologies better than others? You know, who, who are kind of the... I don't want to say the winners, but who who are the the leaders in the space taking up automation, and who are the bit of the laggards? In the so the one of the most demanding areas of the supply chain is around e-commerce, and also there's just a lot of you know dollars going into that process, and therefore what we've seen is the companies that are focusing in on the e-commerce you know, section of, of logistics tended to be the ones that grew up, you know, faster and therefore, you know, attracted more capital when there's a bit of a reinforcing cycle there. So with the, you know, consumers want what they want when they want it. And that meanwhile, we don't have enough people, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, so technology is so needed in that kind of world, right? So that's been the area where we see the most adoption, the biggest companies, but there's other areas that are growing very quickly, like a harder or another area which hasn't had as much adoption perhaps would be areas where there's smaller volumes with each thing or unit being unique because you, you wouldn't make sense maybe to set up a robotic cell for, you know, something where you're going to have to change it in an hour, right? Because you're making a different thing, a widget, whatever it is. Sure. I heard about an example of that with cabinets. So apparently cabinets are often custom made. I've never had custom cabinets. I <laughs> think I must be doing something wrong. So that's an area where it's really been very, uh, you know, manual, right? But there are companies that are emerging that are helping you program robots very quickly and using cobots versus a large industrial kind of, kind of robot. And so areas like that are areas where we were seeing the technology get to a point it's good enough or will be very soon, right? So that even those, well, maybe we can call it the long tail of the supply chain will also be automated. And I've heard, I can't verify this, but that portion of the supply chain is actually larger, right? In terms of maybe people or, you know, total dollars. Okay. Okay. The e-commerce one makes a lot of sense, I guess, because many e-commerce companies would be digital native anyway. They would have started off, you know, being be, being an e-commerce would have started off being digital. And of course, it's a very low margin space as well. And so, and, you know, to your point, it, it is quite warehouse and labor intensive. So in a time of labor shortages, I can see how they would jump on automation very, very quickly. For... Yeah, they bought, you know, like Kiva, like Amazon bought early on, and if I bought Six River, just underscoring that, that point that you just made. Yeah, absolutely. So, Steve, as as the supply chain automation, as it starts to become more widespread, uh, how do you see the competitive landscape 
evolving for both the established players and new entrants in the market? I think it's really interesting because whenever you have this kind of level of disruption, you have the opportunity, you know, technology disruption, you have the opportunity for new players to emerge, right? That were once, you know, just startups, right? That become big companies. And we are seeing that with some of the companies I'd mentioned earlier, but many more that I didn't mention. Yeah. So I do think that we'll continue to see some larger players become mammoth companies. In addition to that, there have been a lot of companies that have raised, you know, a lot of money over the years and may find a home, you know, within the existing set of players that largely do control the market. On one end, you'll see some of these companies who have successfully raised and are now quite revenue generating perhaps be you know not acquired but their own be on their own large we do think that we're going to see a lot of consolidation of this longer tail of of companies that have you know in many cases fantastic technology but perhaps um because of say distribution advantages within a larger company or maybe with a technology they have once married with a larger platform would be you know a fantastic fit but on its own may not be like a company we think you know we'll see a, a lot of activity in the space just generally because of both those things okay you mentioned electrification already but how else do you think an increasing focus on sustainability and environmentally friendly practices might impact the development and adoption of supply chain automation technologies We're seeing it a lot, maybe outside of the the warehouse, when you know you're starting to think about the emissions produced by the, all the trucks and planes, trains, and automobiles moving things around the world. And there are we've seen a few different business models that have some as their central focus, but other just as a result being you know far greater efficiency. So I, I think just the machine learning, the optimization that look has been frankly something that's been a part of the technology for, for many years will continue to get, to get better. We will have seen companies that are switching their fleets, for example, to electric fleets. And that will be, I think we'll, we'll continue to see that as another way where carbon emissions, you know, will, will be addressed. We're seeing it to, um, in let's say, for example, construction sites where large fleets are are switching actually to to electric, which I had not realized, but I guess the torque on on electric is is helpful for you know doing work on a construction site. So that's a little bit outside of the you know warehouse and supply chain, but just another area where the OEMs sure, are switching. It, in construction, it's also handy for permitting because electric vehicles are significantly quieter. And because they don't have tailpipe emissions, you can run them indoors as well without requiring ventilation. So hugely, hugely advantageous in the construction industry to be using electric vehicles, whether it's diggers, whether it's whatever. So, yeah, I can see lots of, of, of reasons why it would be taking off in construction. So what's up and coming with investors, what's kind of coming down the line? What are you guys looking at and saying, ooh, this looks nice and kind of rubbing your hands gleefully? <laughs> <laughs> well, anything I bring to investors, they they immediately love. So I think that, it, you know, being aware of the market we're in now, I think that does play into it, even though, like I said, in industrial slash specifically supply chain automation, there's more energy than I'm seeing in other markets. It's it's still a different kind of financial world that we're in for the foreseeable. And that means that it's investors, you know, first and foremost, have a little bit of, maybe it's before they're all about market size and growth, and that's all still important. But now it's also, you know, a bit of that safety margin. So if you have, you know, if you're getting close to profitability or you can see it, that's, that's important. If you have a little bit more scale, a bit of more diversity with your customer base, these are all things that are 
really top of mind for for investors. Beyond that, some areas that are you know more interesting that we're seeing is around vision based solutions that combine you know machine learning and vision uh, right. is an area we we keep hearing from investors that they're doing a deep dive in thematically. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Cool. Just to name one. There, there's a bunch. <laughs> okay. We're coming towards the end of the podcast now, Steve. Is there any question that I haven't asked that you wish I had or any aspect of this we haven't touched on that you think it's important for people to think about? I think you've done a fantastic job, Tom, covering a little bit of, of giving, I guess, people an insight into what I've been up to and seeing uh, these entrepreneurs change the supply chain you know, world with robotics and sensors. And it's been fun chatting with you a little bit about that. If anyone wants to learn you know, more about what we're doing at, at Drake Star, you can find me on, on LinkedIn, Stephen Dana, and I'd be happy to talk more about it. Super. That was my, my final question was going to be that if people want to know more, is it just LinkedIn or do you have other things? I mean, your website as well, will that give people more information or is there somewhere else people got, should be looking as well? Yes, yeah, so Drake Star's website, we have our supply chain automation report, which goes into all the nitty gritty details of deals occurring in supply chain automation uh, and as my contact information, as well as on LinkedIn. Perfect. Great. I'll put those links in the show notes so everyone has access to them. Steve, that's been fascinating. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Thank you, Tom. It's been a pleasure.